Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay. And I'm Mark DeVoe. And this episode is sponsored by all of you lovely authors out there who are part of our patrons and our Academy members or Academates as we like to call them. Thank you so much to everyone for supporting this show. It really makes such an incredible difference to the running costs and we so appreciate you all. And this week, Mark, we've had quite a few patrons join, haven't we? Five new patrons. Shall I, shall I pipe them aboard, Captain? I think we should. I think we should give them a shout out. <whistles> oh, I can't whistle. Um, yes, thank you all to uh, come aboard. Brooke Lang, Karen Havert, Aubrey Andrus, Sarah Moorhead. That's Sarah Moorhead, the author, S.L. Moorhead, author of the book Witness X. She's joined the gang. And M.L. Cullen. Welcome to you all. Brilliant. And thank you so much, everyone. If you'd like to join our merry band of writers, the most incredible writing community on the planet, as voted by all the members, so completely you know, unbiased, but it's absolutely <laughs> awesome. Do pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. Mr. Stay, this is one of the highlights of my week, I've got to say. I, you know, it's been fun. We should be shouting and arguing, <laughs> ripping it. But here we are. I always look forward to this. I always look forward to this. And it's always a good opportunity for us to catch up because really we don't get a chance outside the show, really, to kind of- We're busy boys, yeah, aren't we? We don't we busy pop down boys, the yeah. pub because yeah, you no. can't. Can't, um, can't do Actually, that. we're in different Not countries, yet. so that makes it very, very difficult. Slight, slightly slightly exactly. tricksy. Yes. So to yeah. fill me in, what's been what's been going on in your life the last couple of weeks? Well, you know, uh, I've been I, I've come out the honeymoon myriad myriad period, the honeymoon period of uh, the crow folk. You know, you have all that excitement when it's published, and you get reviews, and and you're now in the wastelands of publication, where all you know it's up to you now, basically, you know, to keep the momentum going. So I've got I've got plans, I've got plans, Mister D. I've learned from all these hundreds of episodes we've done and all the great authors we've spoken to. So uh, part of that is I've um, I've written four short stories uh, called the Miss Charlotte Quartet, which uh, is what Miss Charlotte is one of the characters in. Uh, the crow folk she's one of the witches bit of a mysterious backstory so with these four short stories i'm sort of uh teasing at who she is and the challenges she's faced and um i'm doing these free as a newsletter magnet so every month uh you get a free short story uh, as an ebook or as an audio book uh so i've had to record an audio book and uh i thought you know i've got the microphone i've got the kit i've got everything what i hadn't really noticed is just how much noise this house makes you know uh i got i got my daughter and a boyfriend living above so if they so much as move across the room it's it's like a a clipper ship in a storm you know like being back at uni <laughs> yeah, it's just and then we got over here is the 299 the a299 to margate and ramsgate and you know every now and then you get a whole peloton of Harley Davidsons going to the seaside or whatever. So, um, so that was a challenge. I need to get some soundproofing. Need to collect some egg boxes. Uh, any tips on that would be much appreciated from a recording yeah. artist such as yourself. But it's been fun. <laughs> it's been fun. And the first one of one of them uh, is called "I'll See You in My Dreams." I put out last week uh, to the newsletter, and people are downloading it and they're liking it. And it's that thing of just keeping the world going, keeping that building on that world and uh you know keeping people interested and and keeping them on the hook and um seems to be working so that's uh, awesome yeah. i love that title by the way i'll see you in my dream well, it's a it's a song it's a song which is um uh it's 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 about you know dearly departed people you know you, you might not see well, them in the real world but i'll see you in my dreams do you know what's really weird about that i'll share this little nugget with uh -huh. you and everyone obviously in the world listening to this but uh so keep it between ourselves but um uh, <laughs> but that's what jen went before jen passed away that's what she said to me she said i'll see you in your dreams oh. and it's always stuck with me because i thought what what a what a really kind of comforting thing to hear uh, that you might still like see a loved one. And I was wondering, I was actually wondering if it was linked to that. So very yeah. interesting, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, There's a lovely version by Joe Brown uh, at the end of the George Harrison Memorial Concert. He just played it on a ukulele. It was just lovely, really, mm. really lovely. It's a great song. Fantastic, brilliant stuff. I've got some interesting news this end, Mark, as well. I've yeah. been, you know, as the, as the kind of like creator of the 200 Word a Day Challenge, I part of the reason why I created it, because they always say, 
build something that you'd use yourself, right? Mm. You always, in, in my entrepreneurial world, I always think like, what would I most want myself? And then I try and build it for everyone else. But you know, <laughs> I've been struggling. I've been struggling to get the writing habit down even for, for the last last year, um, mainly because we're so busy building, you know, the podcast, the, the academy's growing, great guns, academy's doing brilliantly. But um, what I've been really studying at the beginning of this year is all about habits again, but going bigger than just writing habits. I've found that there's two types of people. There's Everyone wants to write, and there's two types of people. There's the people that can that do it, that actually can write, and there's the people that struggle to write, and they're kind mm. of working out why they just can't get and find those 20 minutes a day or get at least get into that routine. And what I've started to look at is I've started to pull the, the wide angle lens back and saying, when we if, we if we can't write and we're focusing on our writing habits being the problem, we're probably looking in the wrong place. So I started looking at what was going on in my world outside of my writing and looking at like all of my time and what's happening in my week and why it wasn't happening. And you know what? I think I cracked the code. In the last couple of weeks, I've started a completely new morning routine and literally planned it out plotted it out and so i know exactly how it's going slightly right. kind of you know anal but it actually keeps it's people <laughs> like me i need that to keep on track um and every single morning for the last three weeks now i've absolutely cracked it like this morning just before this podcast when you shall be rushing out to do this podcast kids to the bus washing up clean the kitchen get on here with Mark to do the podcast. I actually did half an hour, cracked 550 words in 30 minutes. Brilliant. And, um, and, and loving it and got this streak going. So I'm thinking of making something for everyone. If you're interested in, in, if you're kind of like still struggling with your writing habits, I'm going to ask you to come and come and try out the three day challenge. But if you can't do it or you finish, you, you can't make it work after a week or a month or you keep falling off the wagon, then I might be right developing something to help the people that need to go a bit deeper and, you know, really start to delve into why they're not able to write every day. Because I think there's a lot, well, I know, I know there's a lot of people out there that are struggling with this. So, um, so do the three day challenge. You go to 200wordchallenge.com and sign up, try it for three days and drop us a note if you struggle with it. Um, even if you fall off the wagon after a week, we want to hear about the challenges that people are having, not just all the major successes as well. It's interesting because in the UK, uh, kids have gone back to school this week. Um, yeah. uh, rightly or wrongly, but they are, they're going back to school. So I'm seeing a lot of parents, uh, a lot of writers who have been homeschooling, you know, the whole day has revolved around high homeschooling. They've been struggling to write, struggling to find time to write. A lot of people are, you know, putting up Facebook posts, Twitter posts saying, okay, right. I've got to get back into this routine. I've got to figure out, see if I can remember how I, how I can do this, see if I can do this anymore. Um, but yeah, the 200 words a day thing, if it's any consolation, this is if you're one of those people who's thinking, right, kids are at school, I've got a bit more time in the day or the day is slightly more my own. How do I make the most of this? Uh, be reassured that it does work. I mean, we'll do more social media at the end, but we've had so many little bits and bobs come in during the week of uh, people celebrating the 200 word challenge. So um, we've got Inkborn Blade, who is at Inkborn Blade on Twitter, uh, who said, it really works, folks. Give it a go. Build yourself a, a daily writing habit. And then Simple Simon Say Nine on Twitter said, It certainly does. I average about two and a half thousand words a week now. Uh, I may even apply this to a workout, run up and down my stairs once for every paragraph, Could cancel out my crisps habit. Uh, and Inkboard Blaze suggested one hobnob per hundred words. I'm not sure how that works on a calorific scale, but, uh, but you know, <laughs> it's I've worth got, a try. I've got a shout out to Lynn because I lit when, I, when she found out. Um, when when Lynn found out that I was getting the writing habit going, what turned up on my doorstep but a little beautiful bag with I guess you'd never guess what, Mark? Chocolate hobnobs. You know, packet a packet in Canada. Packet of McVitie's hey. hobnobs in Canada. And the rule is, is that I'm allowed I'm allowed one hobnob every day, every time I finish my, <laughs> my minimum 200 words. So I have literally, I've got half a, half a pack left. I don't know what I'm going to do when they run out. I'm going to be like, oh, but yeah, it really, the pop knob thing really works as well. But yeah, you're right. The calorific bit. Mm. Definitely. <laughs> it's yeah. good to it's celebrate. not scientific, though. but you know, w w works for me. Uh, <laughs> Inkborn, Bla Inkborn Blade goes on and says, uh, sit rep for 2021 so far, uh, 23,000 words written, two short stories out in submission, deep into the second draft of my fantasy novel, and I finally got to write the end 
on my YA steam pump book. Thanks to the bestseller experiment for continued motivation. Hashtag 200 words a day. So huge, huge congrats to you, Inkborn, Inkborn Blade on Twitter, uh, on writing the end and that in- incredible, incredible work there. So huge congrats on that. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. And also Claire Hanscom, uh, who is a fellow Unbound author of mine. Uh, she's uh, working on her new book. And uh, she said, this 200 word a day challenge thing is pretty cool. She's already written 30,000 words this year. So we're in March now. Okay, we're in March. Uh, Claire has written 62 days in a row. She's written 30,000 words of a 73,000 word target. She's at Bookish Claire on Twitter. And, uh, you know, so if you if you were sitting there at the beginning of the year thinking, oh, I don't know if I should do this. Should I, can I be bothered? Just think you might have written 30,000 words by now. You might be halfway through your book already. So don't hesitate. Start it right now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and, and congratulations to Claire. I think one of the most important things to mention is a lot of people think, oh, you know, I've missed the boat. I haven't written in January. I haven't written in yeah. February. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've missed half the year. Start today, start tomorrow. Because the thing is, is that it's not a, I mean, years are great because they, they give us a nice kind of beginning, middle and end, you know, and something to aim for. Months are great as well. And we're going to be kind of running challenges for each month, you know, ongoing. But, you know, the challenge for you is just about getting writing. And if you start mid middle of the month, it doesn't matter. You're still going to have more words than if you didn't start at all. So this really works, folks. We've got a lot of, res- a lot of research has gone into this. Um, and it's, it's harder than you think, <laughs> as I know. Um, it's 200 words sounds so simple and so easy. It is easy to write 200 words once you're sitting down. The challenge is sitting down to do it. And sitting bit, down. Yeah. That's the bit that I'm going to be working on. That's my next kind of the next level of this challenge. I'm going to be kind of working on how to help people get into the habit of sitting down because once you're sitting down the words will come absolutely brilliant stuff Mark. um now we're going to dive straight into our interview this week we have a fascinating interview with the incredible mitch ben who i'm going to tell you a story about after we've heard it because i i i actually have a, have a <laughs> uh-oh interesting have uh, you lawyers standing uh, by mitch <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no no it's not, nothing nothing too bad but mark tell us tell us about our wonderful guest this week mitch ben Oh, this is such a treat. Mitch is a comedian, author, satirical songwriter, musician, actor. I mean, like a lot of people, I heard first heard Mitch on The Now Show, uh, which is on BBC Radio 4, the sort of Friday night comedy show. Uh, he also closed Worldcon Science Fiction Convention a couple of years ago with this amazingly geeky gig. Uh, just brilliant. He's got proper geek credentials. He played Zaphod Beeblebrooks in the touring production of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You can hear his voice in the Good Omens TV show and Sandman audiobooks. And he's an author. Uh, he's written The Terror Trilogy. So that's T E R R A as an Earth Terror Terror Trilogy, and it's a series, science fiction series for young and old. It's completely charming. Neil Gaiman said it's delightful. I found myself thinking of Roald Dahl, Douglas Adams, Terry Pratchett, but the voice and story are uniquely Mitch Benz. Uh, so they got Terror, Terror's World, and Terror's War, which is out. If you listen to this on the release of the podcast, it's out today, this very very day. Uh, and so yeah, but there's an extraordinary story behind the publication of the first two books and a fascinating reason why book three took so long. Fantastic. Well, let's listen deeply to this incredible interview with Mark interviewing the wonderful Mitch Ben. Mitch Ben, welcome to the podcast. How are you today, sir? Um, I'm about as good as could be reasonably expected, I think. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's very good to hear what, what, what with the world ending and everything you know it's uh well, yeah. well today I'm, I'm, today and i've been quite chipper good 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 because listeners today the day we're recording this the first vaccine covid vaccine has just been approved in the uk so there is light at the end of the tunnel at least so there are good there are good times ahead hugging in the streets i think the zombie apocalypse has been postponed Yes, most definitely. (laughs) (laughs) So, Mitch, uh, let's talk about your writing career and how you've ended up writing these these three books, uh, Terror, Terror's World and Terror's War. This came about. There's an extraordinary story behind the publication of the first two books. Tell us tell us how those those first two books came about. Oh, it's a long and an and, and awkward story. And it sort of also encompasses how we met in the first place. Mm. Because, all right, many, many, many moons ago, uh, summer 2011, I had to uh, apply for my eldest kid to get a new passport. 
And they don't let you do this anymore. Actually, this story wouldn't happen now. Back then, they the, you, you, the, there's a way of getting the passport renewed where you can get it done on the same day. Uh, it costs a bit more money, but at the end of the day, you've actually got the damn thing in your hand and the jobs are good and you're not sitting there at home waiting, wondering whether it's ever going to turn up. So I needed to get my uh, my eldest passport renewed. They won't let you do it for kids' passports anymore. They changed the law. I think it's to stop, you know, divorced dads rocking up unannounced and sort of spiriting their kids out of the country. <laughs> um, but yeah, back then, you could do it for kiddies' passports as well. So that's what I was doing. I was in town, I've been at the passport office of Victoria in the morning, handed in all the various documentation and the money, and I got a bit of paper saying, come back at like you know four o'clock in the afternoon and, and pick it up. And I, as then as now, live quite a long way out of the centre of town, so I thought, right, well, there's no point in going home, so I'm just going to hang around a bit. So I went on Twitter. This is 2011, so this is, I guess, kind of the early-ish days of Twitter, you know, mm. uh, before it had become all the things it has become in the meantime. And I went on Twitter and said, okay, hive mind, stuck in town for a few hours, don't really know what to do with myself, any suggestions? Thinking that maybe people will come back with, I don't know, exhibitions I should visit or somewhere I should go and have lunch and everything. And out of the blue, I get a tweet from just Galance. That's all it said, just Galance. I didn't know who that was. It just said, <laughs> well, you could come in and talk to us about writing a book. And I thought, right, that's probably <laughs> joking, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this bluff. I am gonna call this bluff. And um, so I had a bit of a Google and found out where Galant lives in Orion House in Charing Cross. And then I thought, right, I'm on my way over there. So I got on the tube, went over to Charing Cross, <laughs> uh, literally bellied up to the front desk at Orion House and said, "Could you find out who does Galant's Twitter feed and tell them that Mitch Ben's actually turned up?" <laughs> um, and, 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 and this was literally about about half an hour after the tweet, you know. And it turns out it was our old pal Simon Spanton mm. who was in charge of uh, Galantz's Twitter feed, and he sort of came downstairs in that sort of dazed Stephen Merchant fashion of his, and uh, said, um, <laughs> "Right, here you are." And I said, "Yes, here I indeed am. That'll teach you." Um, and he said, "Well, you know." And, and the thing is, at the time, I was, you know, still on the radio. And, and, and if anybody knew anything about me uh, as a person, it was that I was a big sci-fi nerd. You know, I am a lifelong sci-fi nerd. And that was, you know, the, the only thing that Simon knew about me, apart from the funny songs. And he said, I was just wondering, given your you know, apparent obsession with this stuff, if you've ever tried writing any of it. And as it happened, I'd already begun work on the first Terror book uh, right. about, I guess about six months previously. So I was already working on this. I was already working on it without a single idea as to what was going to happen to it when it was finished, but I was already working on this book. And I said, well, I've got this idea for these um, for these kids' sci-fi novels. These are kid-friendly sci-fi novels. He said, sort of mm. tens and upwards, but all the way upwards um, is the idea. And he said, "Well, you know, let's 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 have a word. Let's talk. Let's let's sort it out." And um, yeah, we we started you know, conversing and corresponding and eventually they signed me up for two books. Galant signed me up for uh, two books in the, I guess, winter of 2011 going on 2012. And uh, I finished the first one in the spring of 2012 and immediately began work on the second one because Simon said that they really wanted it to be uh, a trilogy. And so mm -hmm. while I did have ideas for other books that, you know, outside that universe, he said, no, 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 press on and not the second one. And so I wrote the second one, Terror's World, and that was already sort of in the being redrafted phase when the first one came out in July 2013. And then the second one came out in July 2014, uh, at which point everything went a bit weird, <laughs> um, which, you know, I've no doubt we will talk about in due course. At that point, things took a turn for the odd. And uh, it's yes. taken me basically six years to sort out. And that's what mm. I'm doing now is, is sorting that out and getting things back on track. Okay, before before we get on to that, because that is there's a whole tangled yeah. story there. Uh, let's talk about because you're known primarily as a songwriter, a musician, and a comedian as well. What were the biggest lessons you learned in switching from writing for comedy to fiction? I suppose it's it's just the, it's it's the sheer scale of the thing. I think a lot of people have often thought that maybe they could write a book, but it's the sheer size of it. Hmm. I mean, the first book is not a long book. It's only 63,000 words. Second one's 65,000. The third one's quite a bit bigger. It's knocking on for 90,000. Right. Um, but 
I think that is what people find so daunting is is the idea of trying to construct something on the, on that kind of scale and and hoping that it would all stick together. And I don't know. I think there is a similar. There's a similar, for my mind, there's a similar essential stage in the process, and that is just find something to hang the rest of it on. Okay. Um, I want to describe this as, you know, just, just find something concrete that you can start working on. Slosh around in a sea of infinite possibility for as little time as possible. <laughs> um, start to define what it is you're trying to do as early as possible. And that weirdly applies to whatever it is you're trying to create, I think. Um, Start trying to define what it is. Start trying to, you know, well, when I'm writing a song, particularly a comedy song, you start off saying, okay, what's the angle? What's the joke? What is it I'm actually trying to achieve? Yeah. And that is what you can think about before you start thinking about, you know, um, tunes and lyrics. It's like, what is what is the song for? What's trying to achieve? And with the book, I think it's a similar kind of thing. What am I trying to achieve? What is this for? What's this story? What's what what what? What is the theme? What? Yeah. What is it that I want people to take away from this? What? What feelings am I trying to in, instill in the reader? And once you've got that, then everything else starts to swim into focus a bit. And that I think is, you know, so I, th- I think that I think the creative process has a lot of common beats. Whatever it is you're trying to actually create. Yeah, no, completely agree. And that idea of discovering what the theme is, I mean, myself, very often I don't discover what that is until I've finished a draft. I can look back at it, step back and go, <laughs> oh, that's what it's about. So it's uh, a lot of people have it straight away and leap in, and I'm very jealous of those people. But I think you're absolutely right. That is uh, that is absolutely key to figuring out the direction that you're going in. It gives you some kind of creative vector, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. You need some kind of bones and then you start to put meat on the bones and oftentimes the process of putting meat on the bones changes the bones but that's mm. okay you, you, you're allowed <laughs> to go with it ultimately it's your book and and you are setting the rules for yourself as you go and you are allowed to break those rules and redefine those rules we're uh, we're obsessed on the podcast with writing habits and the way that people construct their books and the habits they create to write their books and if you hadn't written anything mm. this big before did you have to change the way that you wrote was it a little and often thing or did you dedicate a block of time to it how did that work for you i generally end up dedicating a block of time towards the end of the process when i'm into the the home straight uh and that's for all three books now what that has involved is uh my ex-wife uh clara's aunt and uncle own this barn in the middle of nowhere in a tiny village in derbyshire and on all three occasions i've asked if i can borrow the barn (laughs) <laughs> and I've gone into basically into retreat for like a week, um, switch everything off. And w- w- what I find beneficial about that environment is it's not the absence of distraction. It's the absence of the possibility of distraction. Yeah. You know that nothing else is going to impinge upon your time. And as such, if you're on one, if it's all coming, then you just keep going, even if it's four o'clock in the morning, you know, and uh, there is no external schedule being imposed upon you. So that that's the moment at which I actually sort of dedicate blocks of time. The first book I remember writing, I was, I would occasionally, if I found, I remember at one point sitting on a beer crate uh, backstage at a comedy club with my <laughs> phone in my hand thrashing out a, a chapter just in a, like a tiny little WP program in my phone and then emailing it back to myself and incorporating it into the manuscript. So the, fir- the first one was literally written on the hoof. I, I mean, I have certain idiosyncrasies in the way I write, which um, I, I know not everybody shares. Um, for example, what I will do is once I've got the idea, I am constantly having ideas, mm-hmm. but it's only very occasionally that I have an idea that I can then see how it could be turned into something workable rather than just, oh, that's a great idea. Say, okay, that's an idea and I can do something with it. And what I tend to do, and this for my money is the hard part. I just the other day listened to your, uh, your interview with Ben Aronovich where he was oh, appalled yeah. at how long you'd spent <laughs> writing your breakdown. <laughs> That's, that's the most appalled that I've wound. ever heard. Ben, ben. <laughs> uh, that was so funny though, because you, you'd written what was it a ninety thousand word breakdown or something? Fifty, fifty, not ninety. Man. That was it. Yes, fifty thousand. But I mean, the thing is, that's that's literally only thirteen thousand words shorter than my first book was. And my first <laughs> book feels like a book. You know, it's not it's not a novella. It's a book. But I mean, the, I will because I know Ben said he just forges ahead and has no idea where he's going. I wouldn't dare do that. I need mm-hmm. to know that this idea works as 
a story before I'm going to start devoting that kind of time and energy to it. So what I yeah. will do is I will, and this for me is the hard part. This this is the grunt work, is I will take that premise. And the first thing I'll do is write like a three-page synopsis. Just your beginning, your middle, and your end. That's yeah. it, really. Just the, the really primary plot pivots. That's so that broadly speaking, if you had to explain the story to somebody in five minutes or less, that's what you'd tell them. Mm. And then the really hard part comes and I then do actually write a beat for beat breakdown of the story. Right. Almost like like a scene for scene movie treatment, if you like. Just, you know, yeah. this happens, then this happens, then they go there, then this happens, then this guy turns up, then this happens. And that will usually end up running to about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand words, something like that. And then the actual fleshing out of the book begins. And what I will do is I will copy and paste that whole breakdown into a fresh document and I'll put it in a font other than the one I'm ultimately going to use. So I will right. bring the whole thing over in Helvetica. So I've now <laughs> got a Helvetica breakdown. And what I will do is I will progressively replace it with Times New Roman text. The actual text of the book, I will write in a different font. And so I've got that's that's my working document for the book is this, it, you know, stretches of Helvetica breakdown. Um, <laughs> who I think I saw supporting the wonder stuff in 1989. You just beat uh, me to that joke. You just beat me <laughs> yes. to it. That is, <laughs> I've literally yes, just Helvetica read Helvetica Break Breakdown, yes. Pyramid Stage, Breakdown. 1987. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I've, got, I've, still, I've still got their Peel session on cassette somewhere. Uh, so, yes. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the podcast. I will then Sorry. progressively <laughs> replace slabs of Helvetica <laughs> breakdown with Times New Roman bits of book. And my other <laughs> habit, which I think people out there, the, the, maybe the writers out there listening will, will, will go a bit cold when I tell them this, is I don't necessarily write the book in anything like chronological order. Um, because right. to my mind, the, uh, the most important thing I think is to overcome writer's blocks by whatever means necessary and just keep writing, just keep yes. writing. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember um, yeah. reading one of Neil Gaiman's blogs sometimes and somebody said to you know, I read somewhere that you should never do revisions while you're doing the first draft that, you know, you're going to be doing revisions in due course later. And, you know, you should just keep going. And then, you know, um, when you've got the first draft, then you go back and do it. But somebody else said, no, you should do any revision as soon as it occurs to you, because when you come back to do the second draft, you might not even spot that revision and let it go. And it just went, just do whatever it takes to get the damn thing written. You know, um, yes, and that's best basically what you ever. do. <laughs> <laughs> Just do whatever it takes to get the damn thing written. So one of the things that I do to get the damn thing written is I will just write whatever incident is clearest in my mind at any given time. I will look mm. through this breakdown and I think, which bit of this can I see the most clearly? And I will mm. write that bit. Uh, and then I, having done that bit, I'll think, okay, which bit now? In get, which, which bit am I keenest to write? Which bit really engages with my enthusiasm? Which bit of this whole breakdown am I looking forward to actually writing? Okay, now I want to do that bit. So I will write the thing in all kinds of ways. Often I will, you know, the end will be one of the first bits I write. If I'm particularly mm. clear about how I want this to end, one of the first bits I write will actually be the ending. Um, Certainly, that's the case with Terror's War. The, the last few pages of Terror's War are actually one of the very first bits that I wrote. And, of course, what you will find is when you come to write a bit that happens earlier in the story to a bit you've already written, you'll have to then go back and revise the bit you already wrote because you've now introduced an element which has some bearing on the bit you've, you've, you've subsequently written. Um, and, you know, but... So, and then finally, for me, because, you know, people always say, they go, oh, the most glorious feeling is typing those words at the end. I think, <laughs> yeah, I started with that. You know, <laughs> I typed the words at the end six months ago, and I still haven't finished the damn thing. For me, it's it's like filling in the, la it, it, it's deleting the last bit of Helvetica breakdown as I complete the last bit of Times New Roman prose. And the book is now an, an, an unbroken river of Times New Roman from the beginning to the end. And uh, that is how I get. Now, I'm sure there are authors out there who will hear that and be appalled. Um, <laughs> but I don't care. That's how I can get it to work. And that's, as we said, the only important thing is just do whatever it takes to get the damn thing written. Absolutely. Now, I think you're in good company. I'm pretty sure Diana Gabaldon works that way as well. There are some authors who will do that. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's unconventional, but there are others who do it. And I think, yeah, absolutely. Whatever I think it's, it takes, it's, it's very much it facilitated takes. by the electronic age. I think it's very much facilitated yeah. by the electronic age. I think um, that would have been a really nightmarish way to write a book if you're either typing or freehanding. 
uh, mm. because that would in- incur vast amounts of unnecessary work for yourself when you write an earlier bit that requires you to change a later bit. It's mm. relatively simple to do that if you're in, you know, MS Word or Apple Pages or something. But if the whole thing was, you know, ink and paper, then that would actually be a massive pain in the ass. <laughs> now, let's talk about you moving through the publishing process. What were the big surprises about being published by uh, someone like Golantz? Uh, to be perfectly honest, my expectations were nil. Right. So nothing particularly surprised me, as in surprise suggests that you have some preconceived notion of what's going to happen, and then it doesn't. Mm. I had literally no preconceived notions. I had no idea what was likely to happen. I mean, I had no idea what was likely. To, I had no idea what I was supposed to achieve, <laughs> because I remember actually asking somebody at Galance once, well, what are we looking for here? Because I don't know whether I'm supposed to sell half a million or 50. Right. Yes. <laughs> I, I, as, as somebody, you know, as somebody at the, the absolute bottom end of the newbie author ladder, I have no idea what the expectations are. I don't know whether I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm in, in, into my third or fourth print run within six weeks of it coming out, or whether I'm supposed, supposed to be halfway through the first one this time next year. And, mm-hmm. So I, I literally no idea. Literally no idea. I think I, I got some pleasant surprises with and this if anything just made what subsequently happened you know all the harder was i got some pleasant surprises in how eagerly i appear to be accepted into that sort of literary world i mean this is you know again it sort of swings and roundabouts thing i mean i've no doubt that somewhere in simon's mind when he signed me up was the fact that well this guy's on radio force he's already got a big following and um yeah i had more of a following than your average first time author it's it's fair to say but the only i i already knew that the only real thing it was going to give us was a bit of a pr hook mm-hmm. uh i don't have the kind of profile where people will buy books just because it's me and i certainly don't have the kind of profile where people would buy a bad book just because it was me what it does give us is a bit of a pr angle where basically rather than just say a guy has written a book you will get to say that guy off that thing has written a book and that's really but that did you know i mean for example i got i got the author page in sfx magazine yes now that was <laughs> that was an exciting day because i think you know before me it was lauren bukes and after me it was m john harrison so i thought well that's <laughs> that's a bit of a result you know so that was nice as you say it was very all early on in those Twitter days, and I can't tell you how many acquisition meetings I sat through. It was more with nonfiction. You know, if you had some YouTuber or blogger yeah. or someone who had 2 million followers, that was almost enough to get them a book deal. And it took it took them a few years to learn that actually that rarely translates into sales, you know, into well, actual Well, this is it. Sales. I mean, you know, it, it's one thing to follow somebody on Twitter, but it's an altogether bigger ask to actually get them to spend money yes. on that guy. You know? yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. It, 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 it doesn't necessarily translate. You're quite right. I mean, we should probably point out for the listeners that you were in Galance at the time. Mm. So um, because some some of your casual listeners may not be aware of that. that I mean, what, what was your actual position in Galance at the time? Because I were, was, uh, I worked for Ryan. I was the uh, online accounts manager. So I looked after Amazon that's right, yes. and, and the like. And I do remember. Remember Simon coming down and saying, "I've tweeted Mitch Ben, and I think he's bloody coming in." So, <laughs> so we were all, <laughs> well, I'll teach you. yeah, we were yeah. all very excited. And you know, I was there. I was there for the birth of Terra and Terra's World. Very excited for those two books. Mm-hmm. Enjoyed them both yeah. tremendously. And then yeah. there wasn't a third one. Now, do you want to do you want to talk about? I that? know. Well, it's it's odd because I don't really know that much about it. Yeah, almost immediately after Terra's World came out, the beginning of the summer, twenty fourteen. Um, I then was kind of expecting to get recommissioned to write part three and then maybe something else. And then that just didn't happen. And I've never really had an entirely convincing explanation as to why not. I've heard various conflicting explanations. It is tricky because, um, around that time, I've, I've got a manager. My manager is Ian Wilson. He's been manager for 20 years. He's kind of my showbiz manager. Mm -hmm. Um, he sort of, oversaw you know my radio contracts my tv contracts you know quite a bit of live work corporate live work that kind of thing and he uh, negotiated the first book deal because he was my manager now as i started to move in more literary circles a lot of my author pals said oh you should really get a literary agent because they've you know they're far more better suited to actually you know looking after intellectual property and sorting out movie rights and blah 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 you should be you should be getting a literary agent i was like oh, okay and then 
uh, for you. My p- publishing pal said, yeah, it would really help us if you had a literary agent. Oh, it looks like I need a literary agent. <laughs> and then an author pal of mine recommended me to his really rather high-powered literary agents, and they uh, offered to sign me up right away. And I was, you know, I think extraordinarily flattered, and I went with it. And and I don't really know if that had any bang or what went next, but things started to go a bit weirdly almost as soon as I was signed up. Um, I don't know whether... I don't know whether mistakes were made. I don't know whether mistakes were made by. I don't know whether mistakes were made by me. It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible that something I said or did blew it because you know I'm a big doofus and that's entirely possible. <laughs> but yeah, um, for one reason or another, they didn't sign me up for part three, and this then put me, as you can imagine, in a really difficult situation because mm. you know I was already working on part three. I'd already working on Tales War back in 2014. I'd already started working on it. I already knew how the story was going to end. And this, this put, it put me in an almost uniquely weird situation because I wasn't even like a sort of a first time unsigned author. I was, I was somebody who'd had two books out and then had this essentially, you know, I, I, you couldn't help but suspect it would be a bit of a black mark against you that you've been very obviously not signed up to put book three out. And then where do I go from there? Do I go to another? Cause I, you can't really then just cross down to another publisher and go, yeah, I, I, I want to put out part three of yeah. a trilogy. Mm parts one and two of which are with somebody else, or you can't really say, well, here's the thing, because I've managed to get the rights back to parts one and two, which is a bit of a relief. Um, so, you know, can you reprint two books that have just been in print somewhere else and have now apparently been deemed a failure purely in order to get book three out? And and, and it was a really awkward situation. And had lots of conversations with these agents, uh, and they, we, we seemed to decide that the thing to do would be to try and write something else, try and write something completely unconnected, try and get that published, get myself reestablished as, as a working author. And then a few years down the line, maybe when you know my legitimacy had been reestablished, we could maybe try to do something with the Terra Trilogy again. So I thought, oh, okay, so... I spent a couple of years working on this kind of um, teen dystopia idea, which I then had to abandon because a movie got announced with the exact same story, oh. um, which sub- which subsequently doesn't seem to have happened, incidentally. No. So I may yet revisit that in yeah. due course. And then uh, I, they said, well, can you send me a list of all your ideas? So I sent them a list of all my ideas, and they said, we really like this um, – this kid's fantasy novel that you've had the idea for. And so I said, okay, I shall hammer out a synopsis for that kid's fantasy novel. And then a couple of other things. They, they would say things like, uh, it's worth mentioning this is um, an American agency. They were based in New York. And 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 they would occasionally say things like, you know, we see David Williams is selling an awful lot of books. Why don't you try to write something like him? And I'm thinking to myself, do they get quite how famous David is? <laughs> you know, Because I know, I, one sometimes suspects with Americans that they don't really get that it's possible to be famous if you're not famous in America. Mm. That, that, that famous still counts even when it's famous just within your own country. And I get that, you know, maybe to, you know, as far as certainly somebody working in the publishing business in, in America is concerned, David Williams is just a kid's author. And, you know, but yeah, he is, but he's also this massive slab and he's one of the panel on Britain's Got Talent. Mm. And, and the thing is, his books are great. I've read a whole bunch of his books to my kids when they were little and there's, you know, they're, they're, they're great books, but one can't help suspect that his immense public profile is what drives the sales of those things, at least as much as how good the books are without wanting to take anything away from him. And I would occasionally say, you know, <laughs> you do get, and, and I couldn't really seem to get them to address this question you know do you really think that if i wrote a book that was like a david wanham's book it would sell as well as david wanham's because I, I i kind of have my doubts about that and then there was a weird situation where at the time my uh my ex clara who i'd just recently broken up with she was actually doing a bit of work for neil gaiman at the time she was doing some pa work for him and, and, and she ended up at dinner with my literary agent and they said <laughs> Yeah, and, and they explained to Clara, my ex-wife, they said to what, they, they, but, but, they, but not to me, they said, yeah, we get that David's a massive celebrity and that's probably at least part of the reason why he sells as well as he does. The point is he's created a far bigger demand than he can ever satisfy because his books, great as they are, they take about a week to read and he can only write them at the rate of about two a year. So that's 50 weeks a year when parents up and down the country are dying for something a bit like David Williams and, and there isn't a new David Williams. So I thought, well, why did you say that to me? That makes perfect sense. Okay, <laughs> fine. So I thought, right, fine. I get it. I see what you mean now. So I wrote them a pitch for a series of David Williams-esque, Roald Dahl-esque kids' books, you know, because 
let's mm-hmm. face it, David Wadden is kind of a post-punk role doll. That's kind of what he's doing. And and I sent this to them and I said, here, here's an idea for a series of David Wadden's books. What do you think? And they went, yeah, we're still waiting for you to finish the synopsis on that kid's fantasy. Fine. Okay, I'll go back to that. <laughs> and I thought, you know, well, you actually asked me to write this and I can't even get your opinion on it. But okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> so I then re- I then went back and thrashed out the rest of this synopsis for this kid's fantasy and sent them some sample chapters. Now, the thing about this kid's fantasy, and this is like 2016, 2017, part of the idea of this kid's fantasy is that it's written from a first-person narrator, and the whole thing is written in this kind of degraded dialect. Right. It's it's written in the first person in this sort of slightly pigeony version of English that the characters actually speak in the book. It's written in a degraded dialect. And they hated this. They were like, no, we can't sell this. You cannot possibly get a book published that's meant for kids and is written in, invent- in, a, in a sort of an invented dialect. And I'm like, but it's actually an essential part of the plot. Well, you know, discovering why these people speak this is actually part of the plot. We don't care. That's a terrible idea. You know, and I said, well, look, I think I really need to stick to this because it's an idea. And they said, well, in that case, we can't work with you anymore. And they dropped me. Wow. Uh, so this is about 2017. After about three, they just dropped me. Now, flash forward to about a year ago, my old pal Liz Hyder, who I knew when she was doing PR for BBC Radio, writes a book called Bear Mouth, which is a kid's fantasy <laughs> set in a society where they speak a degraded sort of pidgin English dialect, and it's written from a first-person narrator, so the whole book is in this dialect, and it wins all kinds of awards. <laughs> <laughs> I really need to stick to my guns more often, because at yeah. the end of the day, I I, I I tend to find myself being vindicated. So there you go. So this that brings us up to... So I'm like, I'm now just feeling like roadkill by this point, as mm. you can imagine. And basically what then happens is by the end of 2018, I then think to myself, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to write Terror 3. Yeah. yeah. I've started it. I've got it all plotted out. I'm going to write Terror 3, and then at least all three books will exist. And then I'll worry about how I'm going to get them back out into the world. Because mm. you know, there was always a possibility that some plucky little um, – small publisher, independent publisher would, you know, take pity on me and reprint books one and two there. And I did actually actually have a couple of meetings with um, smallish publishers with a beauty there, but nothing ever came of that. And and finally, about not that long ago, only about five, six months ago, my girlfriend Leslie said to me, you're going to have to put these out yourself. Right. And I'd always been a bit resistant to that because I guess purely for reasons of pure ego, if I'm honest, <laughs> I've always thought, well, that's going to be basically an admission of failure, isn't it? That I once I was a published author with this major publishing company, and now look, I'm apologetically shoveling the things out on Kindle in the hope that, and 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 she basically told me to get the hell over myself, <laughs> 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 which she's very good at. But then she also pointed out the obvious, which is that she is a marketing person mm. of many years experience she used to run the online marketing for a couple of uh the major supermarket chains i'm not going to name them but the two you've thought of yes that's them right <laughs> um and uh she used to run the online marketing for them and she's for the last year or so been doing like freelance online marketing projects for small businesses and she was like look it's possible now to don't call it self-publishing call it indie publishing because that's yes. how it's referred to yeah Call it, it is possible now to put a book out yourself if you're willing to take a bit of time and spend a bit of money, but not the kind of money that would be beyond your reach. It's possible now to do this with an almost indistinguishable degree of legitimacy yeah. than if it had been put out by a major publisher. You can make this so that the, the experience for the buyer and the reader is almost indistinguishable from if they were buying a book that had been put out by a major publisher. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, they w- they won't care. So I, I said, really? She said, yes. And she went away and she made a proper marketing plan for this. Look, if you're going to do this, this is what we're going to have to do. This is what's going to go. Here's all the stuff that you can do yourself by just basically putting the hours in. Here's all the stuff that you are going to have to pay somebody else to do yeah. Yeah. if you want this to really work. And she and she wrote it all out. And I said, okay, let's do it. Let's Let's – Let's indie, let's let's revivify the terror trilogy. Let's get all three books back out there, and and that's what we've done. And and the first one came out the day before yesterday. So terror, which obviously was first published in twenty thirteen, there's a brand new edition out. Um, 
pretty much the same text, just a few revisions. Right. All new artwork, um, which I love. I mean, I you know, the artwork for the Galantz editions was it looked good, but it was all a bit tasteful. Um, and it didn't really look like sci-fi, and it didn't really tell you anything about what was, what was actually in the book. Yes, it's a bit literary, thought, isn't it? I want these. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit. It's all a bit tasteful. Mm. Um, and I thought, I want these to look like proper sci-fi, maybe even a little bit pulpy. You know, not, yeah. not cartoony, not kind of kitsch, but maybe even a little bit pulpy, because also I wanted them to look like books that kids were going to read. Because I always wanted them to be marketed more as kids' books than they ever were the first time around. And this time around, they are. They're being marketed as for 10s and ups. Mm. The last one may be 12s and ups, because the last one, it all gets a bit highfalutin. Not so much. It doesn't get <laughs> nastier or dirtier. It just gets bigger. You know, the concepts in it are all a bit mind-expanding. And yes, thus far, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very content with, 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 with the decision. I'm, I'm really enjoying, I'm enjoying being so much more in charge of the whole process. Yes. Just on a, on a kind of, uh, on a kind of helps me sleep at night kind of level. This could all come to nothing. Yeah, it could all go down in smoke, but at least it won't be because somebody else screwed up. It'll be because I screwed up. And that is altogether easier for me to live with. <laughs> um, but thus far, thus far, it's going great. I mean, it's been on sale for three days and they're, they're moving. They're going out. We've got the Facebook ads up. Um, they're getting a lot, a very, very high rate of, of click through. I keep Whether seeing them. I keep seeing them. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're getting them. Oh, oh that's yeah, good. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that's good. But hopefully people who don't know me are getting them as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, so it's, it, you know, we, we, it remains to be seen just how much of, a direct return we're getting on those. It's kind of difficult to follow up the data too precisely. What you can do is up the money you spend on them and see if the returns go up accordingly. So we might do that in an experimental level in a few days' time. Um, I'm loving the new artwork. We we did um, Leslie did a lot of research into that. That was one of the things that we realized we were going to have to spend a bit of money on was the artwork. Um, for all that I do know, a lot of very talented artists and illustrators thought, nah, we need we actually need to spend money on this. Then yeah. we, we looked at a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of artists' websites and portfolios, and then she discovered this. It's it's kind of a an art studio in Ukraine called Myblart, M-I-B-L-A-R-T. And I think they're kind of a collective. They're a bunch of artists and designers, and they specialize in sci-fi fantasy covers. I think they specialize primarily in ebook covers. And mm. uh, and and we we engaged them because I think they were quite keen because they said, "Look, if you do this right, there's three whole books in it for you." Yeah. Because obviously, we want the artwork to be done. You know, we want the artwork for all three to be of a piece, as it were. Mm. And uh, we just really like what they've done for us. And also, they're incredibly receptive to feedback, so we can be really nitpicking with them. And I think that might be <laughs> partly a function of the fact that they're they're kind of a company and a studio collective rather than an artist with a personal vision. Mm. <laughs> so, so, so we can actually go, nah, we're the client here, buddy, and we're going to call the shots. And they're like, <laughs> fine, you're the client, you call the shots, you know, rather than, don't you understand what I'm trying to do here? Um, <laughs> you know, so, so that's good. It's, it's very much a kind of a client control a relationship which is what you need at this stage and so they've they're, they're back out and um yeah book book one has been up for three days we wanted to get book one back out in time for christmas because it is of course available in paperback it's print on demand paperback mm. uh rather than doing a print run but basically what we've ended up with is a situation where the only real difference between what we've got and what we would have if we were with a big publishing house is the one place you're not ever likely to find these books is in waterstones Mm. Um, that may yet happen. It is possible to get them placed in retailers, but that's not something we're, we're looking at at the moment. Mm. But that's the only real difference right now between this book being out with a, a big publishing house and putting it out ourselves is you're not likely to stumble across it in a bookshop anytime soon. But what you've done with this website is you have a newsletter. You're building a direct relationship with those readers. If you sign up to Mitch's newsletter, you get a free ebook, which is you know a visitor's log of Earth, which is great fun. Yes. So you know, it's, it's a little prequel story. I've written a little mm. exclusive prequel short story to the first book, which yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people are downloading that, which is great. And um, then we 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 
will keep those people abreast of, of developments. And um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very lucky in that uh, you know my, my 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 girlfriend is a bit of a marketing genius. And and the thing is, I've never looked down about. There is a tendency, I think, amongst you know bohemian assholes like myself to be totally <laughs> snitty about. All that. Um, there, there, there is there is a tendency for us to be very sniffy about all that. And I've never been sniffy about that kind of thing i've always had an immense amount of respect for people who engage in the business side of art yes because i think you'll find all those kind of or all, all those the, the those sort of you know um oh yes i like to let my work speak for itself but generally you know they're paying the lucian freud agency two grand a week to make sure the work speaks for itself you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I, I've I've got no problem. You know, I don't put the time and effort into the stuff I do to then decide that I'm too cool to tell anybody. About. Yes, no, quite exactly. Um, I've got, I've never, I, and, and I've always had a great deal of respect for people who really understand the mechanics of how that whole end of the business works. And it's been quite fascinating taking so much more of that on myself. Well, folks, if you want to check this out, go to mitchben.com forward slash Terra Trilogy. Uh, book one is out now. Terra's World is coming in February. And Terra's War, yep. the one I'm really, really looking forward to, it finally wraps it all up, Wee! is coming on 15th of March, 2021. But do check that out. Mitch, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a real joy speaking to you. And let's get you back on again soon. Let's let's talk about the whole experience Absolutely. and look back on it and, and go from there. Well, quite, because just at the moment, I can't honestly tell you how successful this has been because I don't really know yet. But, you know, I have to have a book coming out in March that would be nice to plug. So if I can turn up again around then and I'll let you know how this has all gone. I'm sure we can figure something out. And I'd just like to say, just for the listeners, uh -uh. I liked Helvetica Breakdown before they were cool. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's start a bank called Hermetica Break. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Rich. And listen, best of luck with all your projects as well. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Take care. Cheers, buddy. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Mitch Ben, what <laughs> he's amazing, isn't he? So much energy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now I've got to tell you, Mark. Um, Mitch, I it's so funny. I used to live in Cambridge in England all these years ago before I moved to Canada. And one night we always used to love love to catch stand-up comedians. We had the most incredible stand-up comedians come to Cambridge in these times. I remember seeing mm -hmm. Simon Pegg in front of 20 people. Simon Pegg doing stand-up in a little Grolsch tent. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and, and the next night, Al Murray to like 40 people. And, um, I remember one night we found this, there was a new pub. It was kind of very studentsville. So a lot of comedians would come out there and we showed up at this pub one night to see, just to see what was on. And downstairs, there was a tiny little room, a tiny little stage, um, and a couple of people and none other than Mitch Ben. And I was sitting there thinking, I'd never heard of Mitch. It was 1998, I think. Um, right, and right. I'd never heard of him. And we had the best night it was so funny and to this day yeah. i still have a great gig great he gig. does he's it's brilliant um i'm I, to this day i still have a cd that i picked up at the end of the show called the called the unnecessary mitch ben <laughs> it's like and it was so brilliant when i heard that you were actually you'd actually got an interview with him but man what a story what a story he's been been through the ring hasn't he where do you want to start? I mean, there's so much to talk about here. There really is so much to talk about here. Um, I mean, first of all, Twitter in 2011, that was when it was just like your friends and maybe Stephen Fry. So it was yeah. a very different world then, you know. Um, but yeah, it's uh, just to put it in some sort of context, because Mitch, there was a, there was an article in the, the Guardian where Mitch talked about the same thing with our friend David Barnett interviewing him. And it was, mm. a, it was an interesting article, but it was, um, you know... I, it was one of these ones, you know, don't read the comments, but you read the comments of people go, oh, celebrity got a deal, you know, smallest violin, blah, blah, blah. But actually, I think Mitch got caught up in, in a period of big change in publishing where um, 
a lot of those big publishers, not just Orion, all all of the publishers, all the big publishers across the board, went from a, a situation where editors, where they'd have acquisition meetings and editors used to say, you know what, I love this book, I'm passionate about it, I have no idea what it's going to sell, but can you trust me on this one? Hmm. To a situation where they the acquisition process became a lot more rigorous you know that you had to provide projected sales numbers based on the previous performance of similar titles and, and when you have something a bit left field like like Mitch's it becomes so much more difficult to do that so i think he probably got caught up in the whirlwind of that and that is now the norm you know you know publishers will have acquisition meetings and editors now have to bring spreadsheets saying okay i've based my projected sales on five similar books over a period of three years, uh, and the main retailer might be the supermarkets, or the main route to market might be Amazon or the high street. And this is what I think it will sell in the first weekend, and this is what I think it will sell over twelve months. That's the level of detail they go into. Uh, whereas when Mitch was first acquired, it was oh great, we got Mitch Ben, <laughs> let's let's do it, and it was a little bit wild west, you know. And you, yeah. the publishers, those big publishers, got so big now. That they that just doesn't really happen, so um, it's uh, it's it's an extraordinary situation, and I think poor old Mitch got caught in the, in the middle of that. But what he's done, and what's so extraordinary, and f- and folks, he mentioned his partner there, Leslie O'Connor, who works in marketing. We have a deep dive with Leslie, where she goes into considerable detail on how she basically regenerated Mitch's books and marketed them. And goes through what she did on the website and newsletter and all sorts of stuff. It's a, we'll put a link in the show notes. You go to bestsellexperiment.com and look at the podcast episodes. You'll have all the show notes there with links and everything on how to listen to this episode. That's a deep dive for our, our uh, patrons and academies. Um, and it is, it is remarkable. He's completely turned around. He's got the right cover up for it now. He's got a, you know, brilliant website, which has a readers group and newsletters and free things. And, you know, someone like Mitch, who is a force of nature, who knows, you know, just through gigging and interacting with his audience, he knows what they want. He knows, you know, that you have these lead magnets to lure people in and then you sell them, you know, the books and stuff like that. He's, he's doing everything right. So maybe this is what they were always destined to be. I love the fact that Mitch has, you know, it'd be so easy. It'd be so, so easy just to kind of say, oh, what a nightmare. And just kind of like think I'm undone with this. <laughs> right. But the thing is, is that what I love about M- Mitch's attitude, it, it's like, you know, you just, you kind of work through the challenges and then you think, right, what options do we have? And often what we see when we hear these kind of stories, if we could kind of fast forward five, 10 years from now, sometimes you, you see that the challenges that come up in our life actually present us with massive opportunities. And if we see them as opportunities and, you know, at the time we're like, oh, what a nightmare. But if we work with what we've got, um, sometimes it can be the catalyst to something even bigger or greater. And it leads us to where we're actually really needing to be in our life. So I love the fact that he, he's not, he's not kind of, he's just forging on. And, and more importantly, like what a hardworking guy. I mean, if there's a lesson of anything of the many lessons in his interview, but if there's a lesson to anyone out there, you know, you know, the, 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 what is it? The, the lucky hard you work, the lucky you get. Right. I think with yeah, Mitch, yeah, yeah. he's yeah. trying everything, um, different, different angles. And he is one of the hardest working people out there. I mean, I, I popped over to his patron the other day just to see him like, he's, he's, he's already stuck up a thing about Megan and Harry, a, a song. And I'm like, how did he write that yeah. in, in three minutes? Yeah. And, you know, like, um, and every, you know, he's putting out so much great content um, and it's a really great lesson for us. You know, you do have to work hard. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't come easy. Um, but when you, when you put in the groundwork, you know, Mitch has, Mitch has created a, a really sustainable career for himself. And I think it speaks to the passion that he has for these books as well. In that, you know, it was the idea that wouldn't go away. He couldn't just abandon it. And I think as well, that's just one of those tips we say to authors when they've got maybe three or four ideas for books, which one do I choose first? It's usually the one that won't go away. The one that's constantly prodding you going, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. That's the one to go for. And clearly, you know, he had more ideas, more story for this trilogy, you know, and he, he desperately wanted to, to get it out there. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, he was, he, he talked about this thing where he had, Publishers and agents sort of saying to him, dictating what he to write. They're saying, "Can you write something that's a bit David Williams? Can you write something that's a bit like, a bit like the other thing over there?" 
And, you know, they, they may be talking from a position of, you know, informed advice. They know the industry. They know that kind of thing. But if you don't love what you're writing hmm. and, and if someone's trying to twist your arm into it, just walk away, Rene. You know, I've, I've done it. I spent two years working when I was starting out as a writer. I spent two years working on a screenplay, which wasn't me at all. It just wasn't the sort of thing I'd. I might watch it on a Friday night, but it's not the sort of thing I wanted to write. If you're going to write something, you need to live with this thing for a very, very long time. And it, you know, if it has your name on it as well, it's going to be your brand out there as well. So if, you know, as as Mitch said, he says, I need to stick to my guns more often. I think we all need to do that. You know, mm. follow your passion, follow the thing, the idea that won't go away, because that there will be something in there that that is intrinsically linked to you and your voice and your story. Yeah. So, so important. And actually, there's another really important reason to do that. And that is when the going gets tough. If things don't just kind of roll out and, and you know, all the bells and whistles start ringing. It's at that point, whereas if you really believe in something, if you're really passionate about what you've written, if you're really proud of what you've created, you will keep, you will dig deeper and you'll, you'll put in the extra effort. Whereas it's something that you're not really passionate about. You're going to, you're going to give up at that point. And then you might get despondent and give up altogether. And that's what we don't want to see people do. So I think it's a really important lesson is that, you know, write what you love, you know, you can always twist it in the commercial ways, you know, to try and to try and make it a better selling book than than maybe it might be if it's going to be very, very niche. But write what you love because ultimately when you get to the end of your life, and I'm always doing this on the podcast, aren't they? Like, oh, here he goes. But when you get to the end of your life, you look back over your life's work. It's going to be one of those chapters in your life. You know, that book on your shelf that all your kids, grandkids, great grandkids hopefully one day will pick up and read and say, well this was this was Mark's book. This was John's book. This was Rachel's book. Um, it, it's a representation of a chunk of your life. And we all know this is not, you know, this is not about a three, five minute, 10 minute exploit. This is dedicating, you know, if you're utterly insane at writing a whole month of your life to writing a book, Shannon Mayer. And if you're normal, then it's like two, three years of writing that book. And we don't get that many two, three year chunks in our lifetime when you add it all up. So, it's also about thinking about your legacy. It's like, what do you want to be on that shelf to represent your life and represent a bit about who you are as an author, how you're seeing the world today? And um, and I also think that if you're passionate about the book, the passion comes through in your writing. If you're not passionate about yep. the book, it doesn't. And it it's more likely going to be a drab read for everyone else. So yeah, that's pe people see through it. Totally. Absolutely. Brilliant. There's one one other thing that was mentioned on the interview that I was really fascinated about. And it was it was in reference to when you were talking about having meetings back in, you know, back in um Orion and Glance. And this idea that like these people these influencers with huge followers, like two million followers, doesn't necessarily relate to book sales. Um yes. I'm I'm curious about that because in my mind, that had always been like, well, if you've got 2 million followers, you're, you're going to sell at least, you know, 50,000 books. What's the reality of, that you've seen behind that? No, ubiquity does not equal popularity. Uh, it's such a – I mean, Twitter, it's so easy to follow on. There's there's no commitment whatsoever, no mm. commi commitment to – unlike a newsletter. A newsletter, there's there's a bit more of a binding it's, – it's like saying, okay, I'm going to commit to this. You're going to send me just stuff directly to me that speaks to me, and I'm interested in what you're doing. There's a slightly more binding social contract there. Whereas with Twitter, it's just like, oh, I like him. I like him. I like that. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah, he's that chef on the telly. Oh, yeah, she's that dancer on Strictly. You know, it, it, it's, it's so casual. And the other thing is when Twitter started out, you had those lists, you know, in the papers. Here are the 50 people you need to follow on Twitter. And so everyone followed them because they didn't know yeah. who else to follow. So they, you ended up with the Stephen Fry's who had all these – and Neil Gaiman's who had all these millions and millions of followers, right? Mm. Neil Gaiman and Stephen Fry do sell a lot of books. But, you know, there, there are those – celebrity chefs uh the people who go on you know celebrity game shows and whatever uh and there was a period where uh, editors were going well they've got millions of followers so we must if only we sold a tenth of their following we'd be quits in but it just doesn't work like that it just mm. it does not there's such a casual relationship that uh you know they the sales don't always some do i mean you know you get um some work really well. A few years ago, uh, Orion did Sarah Millican, the um, mm. comedian. But again, Sarah would tweet stuff and we'd see spikes in sales. But actually, it was when she sent her newsletter that we really saw the big spikes. Oh, you interesting. Know? And well, that, that about, for me, 
you know, I, I have a I have a love hate relationship with with social media. Um, I think with things yeah, like Twitter, both. that well, I think everyone does. To be honest, I think even if you kind of if if you're really successful at it, you become a bit kind of a slave to it because you have to keep mm. feeding the beast, as it were. Yeah. But the um, the other challenge is that. Twitter, I always think of things like Twitter and even Facebook, um, Snapchat, I mean, pretty much all of them. They're a bit like a kind of a fast flowing river. Unless you happen to be standing on on the river fishing at the time when that fish goes past, then you, you don't even know it exists. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, we've had actually a really interesting discussion about this in the coaching in the academy, because I, I think a lot of people get really hung up on this idea that they have to do social media and there's no choice. It's like, well, if you're not doing social media, you're no one. And we were talking about this love-hate relationship and kind of guiding authors as to how to use social media in, an, in, a, in a focused, effective way. We've given them some tips about scheduling and, and that you don't have to be a slave to it every single day, that there are some really successful ways to run a successful social media and and it be a very small part of your month as an author, but still still appear to be very active, you know, in, in, in the public eye. Um, so it's kind of interesting because I think a lot of people get put off even writing a book nowadays because they think, well, I have to get 30,000. I once heard actually on a, on a, uh, a conference that you need to get, you need to have 30,000 social no, media followers if you want to be an author. And it was like, well, where's that figure come from? And what does that mean? Does that mean a combination of all of the sub platforms or 30,000 on, you know, Facebook or Instagram? Um, I think it drains us, absolutely drains us as authors whilst we're trying to write our book. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I, the other thing as well, the social media landscape is going to change The Facebook is come under incredible scrutiny. Uh, mm. Twitter, has come under incredible scrutiny because of the role they've played in some of the you know upheavals in recent history, uh, and they're they're just too big. I mean, I got a, I got an Oculus VR thing at, at Christmas, oh, yeah. Yeah. and I have to log into my Facebook account to make that work. Why? Why? What is the point? What? What the? Why? Because Why? they're because they're tracking your eyeball movement, Mark. Yeah, they are. They really are. They really are. <laughs> Um, you know, so Ooh, he's looking I, I at hobnobs see. again. He's looking at hobnobs. Quick, send him a hobnob. Yeah, exactly. Apple. Yes. <laughs> Ex- yes. Exactly that. So you know, I, uh, <laughs> I I can see these things being broken up, and I always if I, if I ever talk to anyone about authors and social media, I always bring up your example of the MySpace page. You know, and yeah. how that can all Thank evaporate <laughs> overnight. I, it's I such a it's a lesson it's a from story. history. It's, it's a lesson a great, from history. It's a great do, do you want to remind, remind, remind listeners, Mr. D, what, what happened? Well, actually, yeah. Well, in a nutshell, you can hear the whole clip. If you come to the Academy, if you want to join the Academy, what we've done is we've broken every clip that we've ever done on the podcast in the Academy. So you can just type in MySpace and you'll get my clip. But the the, the, the premise goes is that back in the um, early 2000s, when MySpace kind of launched, this is pre-Facebook, pre-everything pretty much, I built a following of 200,000 authors on MySpace as part of my music career. Absolutely incredible, like thousands and thousands of messages and and then one day mark zuckerberg across the road um opened, <laughs> had a free party said hey free booze across the road just as myspace are running out of booze in the myspace party and everyone left and so the the, the moral of this story is you could you might have two hundred thousand followers but if they're not in the house if they're not at the party you're just basically shouting into the wind so it's a very important thing we talk a lot um there's a lot of stuff in the academy about this which which kind of i think relieves people of this kind of fear and worry about yeah. oh blimey if i'm not doing this i'm not doing that because it's it's a machine and it's pressure and there are ways to manage it um and i, I mean, think the, it's super important to get get used to what those are the important lesson is to have your own corner of the internet it can be a one-page website a free website yeah. a wix or wordpress website uh, and a newsletter and the newsletter, you know have yeah. some kind, kind of direct contact with your readers and that's what my big focus is between now uh, we're in March now. Book two, Babes in the Wood of the w- Wishes of Woodville, comes out end of October. My focus with the short stories and other giveaways that I'm going to be doing is going to be all about building that newsletter, building that direct relationship with people who are interested in the book and want to know more. And then when book two comes out, boom, straight to them. You know, so Absolutely. no middleman, no hoping that they're in the stream the same time as I am. No, I mean Facebook isn't even a street. It's like a trout farm with cages everywhere, and they're saying. 
that thing you like might be over here, but you're going to have to pay us to see it. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, um, I know. yeah. Uh, I and and in the it. spirit of educating every author out there, it's so, so important that when you have a platform in which you can, you, you know, which isn't your own, like, you know, if you're on iTunes, for example, doing a pod, podcast and somebody listening right, right now doesn't have any direct connection with that podcast, you always have to remind them that come to our website and sign up to the Bestseller Experiment podcast newsletter oh, because segue. because <laughs> it means that we can communicate with you directly. And if so, if you're a new listener and you've loved, you're loving this show and you think, man, I, I really want to, I really want to check in with the two marks every, every show. What we do is we send out, we do send out an email newsletter. We've actually got our processes up and running now and it's happening uh, without fail. So we'll send you a direct email with a link to the player where you can listen to the podcast, plus some other cool bits and bobs that we drop in every now and again. So get to bestsellerexperiment.com and click on the newsletter tab and put your email in there. And then we can uh, we can practice what we preach, Mark. Absolutely. Beautifully done. <laughs> Brilliant Beautifully stuff. Done. So we've got a bit more social media, Mark, haven't we, to close the show, I believe. Just a couple of things. One, a uh, big congratulations to Steve Gowland, who is at Steve Gowland on Twitter, writes as SC Gowland. Uh, now, if you've been following the 200 words a day uh, hashtag, uh, you'll know he's been one of our, our lead people, you know, writing every day, banking those words. And his new book, Coven of Shadows, uh, is out. And, uh, you know, he says here, it's here and it's lovely. I much prefer that he's been doing certain printing and he's doing, you know, he says, I much prefer the six by nine size compared to the previous smaller size. And uh, his, his book will be available on 13th of April. But big congratulations to Steve. He's a big supporter of the podcast. And that 200 word a day thing has definitely helped him. And uh, I, I just saw this brilliant tweet from uh, Laura Bleegan who is at Laura Bleegan uh, on Twitter. And she says, I'm working through a couple of podcasts from 2019. And, and she said, I've just listened to episode 236 of the bestseller experiment from October 2019. And the two marks have started talking about how great they think 2020 is going to be. <laughs> Ment mental time travel is fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen back to that now. I can't remember. What. I, I think I actually, I genuinely remember talking about that because I had this, uh, something about the 2020, we were talking about, what was it? The year, what was it? with 2020, that's it. Perfect vision. I remember it now. We were talking 2020 about 2020 vision. vision. Yeah. 2020 vision. It's going to be a brilliant year. You're going to have perfect, you know, perfect clarity about what your year is going to look like. Well, in some ways, in some ways, you could say that prophecy came true if you were a writer, you were on furlough, and he didn't have kids. Mm, Possibly. Yeah. But for Possibly. a lot of people, it hasn't been the yeah. best. It's, but, it's a year well, to remember of nothing else. Yeah. Maybe we yeah, maybe yeah. we should have re maybe we should have really um rephrased that as possibly the best decade ever. Because I still believe, and someone's gonna quote me on this in two years from now, I still believe that when we come out of this, we're all gonna be appreciating life so much more than we ever have. And so yeah. the rest of the decade is gonna be absolutely awesome. So Laura, I hope you're still listening to us and uh, 2020 <laughs> is a is a good one. She'll be hearing this in two years when she's caught exactly, up with this yeah, episode, yeah. right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for getting in contact, Laura. That's brilliant though. I always I always love to be uh I, I it's a beautiful thing about making podcasts, is it? Your words are forever uh <laughs> etched in stone and thrown back at you absolutely brilliant, folks brilliant. if you want to get in touch with us on social media, we are Twitter at bestseller XP, Instagram at bestseller XP and bestseller experiment on facebook uh so yeah come and say hi drop us a line go go to bestsellerexperiment.com and you'll see the contact us tab and you can drop us a line there we answer all those emails fantastic and if you'd like to join the 200 word challenge it's 200 wordchallengecom 200 wordchallengecom and also if you're interested in joining the academy we have a wait list up and running so come and get your application in before we open the doors if you want to get priority uh, treatment for the next we always sell out there's there's a very small number of people that we can accept at a time so do that now bank it if you want to find out more um, if you just want to find out more about the academy it's academy.bestsellerexperiment.com and mark it's been an absolute pleasure have a great couple of weeks we've got some you brilliant guests coming up and uh, look forward to hearing all your news in a couple and it's a goodbye from mark one and a goodbye from Mark Tool. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> 
to read Back to Reality, the best-selling novel of the bestseller experiment by the two marks, go to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash back to reality. And subscribe to this podcast to get loads of extra bonuses. Go to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash subscribe.